Hello everyone and welcome to the grand final hackathon presentation event. My name is Kirsty Scott and I'm the Senior Alumni Engagement Officer at one of the UK government scholarship programmes, Commonwealth Scholarships. I'm delighted to welcome you to the grand final hackathon presentation event today. The hackathon is a cross scholarships collaborative event designed to coincide with the 26th UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties or COP26 which is taking place between the 31st of October to the 12th of November in Glasgow in the UK. One of the stated goals for COP26 is collaboration, and in many ways, this goal underpins all others. It's a recognition that, in the words of COP President Alex Sharma, on climate, the world will succeed or fail as one. With this in mind, we're delighted that the HMG Scholarships Alumni Climate Change Hackathon is a truly collaborative and global event bringing together alumni across scholarships and across the globe. Over 130 alumni have participated in this event, representing almost 50 countries and territories. The event has been jointly organized between the three FCDO funded scholarships, Commonwealth, Chevening and Marshall. And one of the objectives of these scholarships is to build global cooperation and networks. And it's been great to see these networks expand through this event and opportunity. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the scholarship teams at the ACU who have been working together over the last few months to make this hackathon possible. Last week, 36 hackathon teams presented the policy proposals they have been developing at three presentation events under each of the four COP26 goals, finance, collaboration, adaptation and mitigation. Teams presented a range of policy proposals and our judging panels faced a difficult decision in selecting one team to represent the COP26 goal at today's grand final. I'd like to thank all of the teams who've taken part in this event and worked incredibly hard to develop their policy proposals, as well as our panel of expert advisors who generously volunteered their time to provide support and guidance to teams as they developed their proposals. Of course, thanks go to our panels of judges who have also volunteered their time and expertise. Can I just remind attendees um, to stay on mute um, just during the event? Thank you. Um, our panels of judges have also put questions to teams on their ideas, as well as making the hard decisions on the winning teams who will be presenting today. And we're very excited to bring together these four teams and to hear their presentations again. While only one team will be announced as the overall winner of the Climate Change Hackathon, we hope that all teams will continue to work together to develop their policy proposals and strengthen the networks they've formed as well and make this a really lasting opportunity. Now that I've just given a short introduction and I'm sure we're all very familiar with the hackathon and its background in each of the teams presenting today, I will move on to the format of the event. And just to note again that we are recording and please do um, keep microphones on mute as we go. Between the 27th of September and the 8th of October, over a period of 24 hours, hackathon teams have worked to develop policy solutions which address a pressing climate change issue and which contribute to one of the four COP26 goals as mentioned. Today, we'll watch presentations from the four selected teams from last week's presentation events, each representing one of those goals. One presenter from each team will have five minutes to present the climate related policy proposal. I will be keeping strict time and will interrupt when there is one minute left for the presenter. Another member of the team will be answering questions submitted by attendees via the chat box. So if you do have a question, um, we encourage you to pop that into the chat box as you're thinking of it. Um, don't worry about distracting the speaker as another member of the team will answer. Following each presentation, our judges may ask one to two questions live, which will be answered by the presenter. But again, we encourage everyone to put any questions to the team using the chat box. And that brings us to um, our judges today. Um, we're joined today by a panel of five expert judges who will assess each presentation. Um, and I will now introduce our panel. So today we're joined by Dr. Paulette Bino, Dr. Paulette Bino is a senior lecturer, the former Dean of the Faculty of Earth and Environmental Sciences, and the current Deputy Dean of the School of Graduate Studies at the University of Guyana. She serves in various capacities nationally, regionally, and internationally, including Chair of the Green Engineering Panel for the Caribbean Examination Council, and an advisor to the current Chair of the Group of 77, 
and China for the UNFCCC negotiation. We're also joined by Dr. Hasib MD Erfanula. He's a biologist turned development facilitator who often introduces himself as a research enthusiast. Over the last two decades, he's developed an interest in an understanding of environmental governance, climate change adaptation, disaster risk management, technological innovation, poverty alleviation, scholarly communications and research impact, all focusing on the well-being of human and nature. Over the years, Hasib has worked for different international development organisations, academic institutions, donors and the government of Bangladesh in different capacities. Currently an independent consultant, he's also a visiting research fellow of the Centre for Sustainable Development at the University of Liberal Arts Bangladesh in Dhaka. Hasib is passionate about creating, capturing and communicating knowledge, testing and promoting new ideas and facilitating collaboration and networks. He and his co-workers, co-workers have authored around 40 journal articles, written, edited and contributed to more than 45 books and other publications, and written more than 130 articles and thought pieces on a wide range of topics. He's also engaged with several global mentoring programs involving young researchers and professional. And I'm delighted to say Hasib is a 2001 Commonwealth Scholar. Um, our third judge today is Sergei Maslachenko. He's the former Deputy Minister for the Ministry of Energy and Environmental Protection of Ukraine. During his time as Deputy Minister, he led the preparation of Ukraine's Green Energy Transition Strategy to 2050 and the National Energy and Climate Plan and the Corporate Governance Reform and Strategies of State-Owned Energy Company. In 2020, he founded Climate Finance and Clean Tech, an investment and analytic platform dedicated to matching a fast growing climate finance industry with vast and high return business opportunities in clean tech in Eastern Europe and Ukraine. In 2007 to 2019, Sergei led the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development work on energy efficiency and renewable energy in Eastern Europe and contributed to $2 billion worth of investments in the region. In 2017 to 2019, he was a board director at the Green for Growth Fund, which invested over $600 million in 19 countries. And we're also pleased to say that Sergei is a 2002 Chevening Scholar joining us on the panel. We're also joined by Dr. Joanna Poon. Dr. Joanna Poon is the head of built environment within the College of Science and Engineering at the University of Derby, where she's responsible for the overall development and management of the division, covering the subject areas of civil engineering, quantity surveying, construction, architectural technology, and interior architecture. She's also the lead for the ERDF Low Carbon Project Lead, through which she actively engages with built environment professional bodies and wider academia serving as a national committee member, external examiner and external panel member for undergraduate and postgraduate courses and editorial boards for international journals. She's an active researcher, and publishes widely in pedagogy in the built environment, instruction project management and property investment. Our fifth judge today is Dr. Mark Tebbett. He's a lecturer in the School of International Development in the Environment and International Apologies, in the School of International Development. He's an interdisciplinary social scientist whose research addresses issues related to how people and populations respond to and adapt risks arising primarily from global environmental change. Within this broad area of research, his particular interests are in human migration, mobility and forced displacement, vulnerability, resilience and adaptation, and disaster risk reduction and risks linked to a changing global climate. He has worked in many countries around the world, but currently focuses on the, greater Horn, on the Great Horn of Africa and India. In addition to his work at DEV, he is a theme leader in the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research and leads the centre's research activities on understanding how to address the twin goals of poverty alleviation and achieving meaningful action on climate change. Active research projects include climate resilient development pathways in semi-arid regions of Africa and Asia, an IDRC FCDO funded project focusing on ensuring development within semi-arid regions is sustainable and supports adaptation and mitigation goals, and a Royal Society funded project looking at drought resilience in East African drylands, dryland regions, which explores how populations manage the impacts of water scarcity amongst others. So we have a very expert panel joining us today. Um, so welcome again to our panel of judges who I'm sure are looking forward to the team presentations. 
And on that note, we will now begin the first of our four team presentations. The first team will represent the COP goal finance and their team is Accessible Finance Brazil, the team name. The team is comprised of nine members and all are from Brazil and are all achieving scholars. Our presenter will be Guillermo Castro and answering questions in the chat box will be Manuela Rangel Cantalice. Over to you, Team Accessible Finance Brazil. Thank you, Kirsty. Welcome, everyone. We are the Amazon Green Credit Hub, a multi-stakeholder platform to facilitate microcredit origination through an environmental justice lens. First slide, please. Brazil is one of the 10 largest emitters of CO2 in the world, and 72% of these emissions come from deforesting. So the no return point of the Amazon destruction should be a global priority. Like climate change, the impact of deforest destruction is extremely unequal, especially for smallholders, indigenous people, and communities depending on the forest to survive. However, due to the lack of economic and political incentives, there is a still strong pressure to deforest. An effective tool to help smallholders and sustainable cooperatives fighting this problem would be providing financial solutions to promote bioeconomy value chains. Yet the access to funding is also unequal to these groups. There are several challenges, including the document regularization and banking condition, too high ticket offered by local institutions, and the lack of capacity to prove a recurrent revenue. The consequence is that even when green finance is available to invest in mitigation and sustainable projects, due to the lack of local knowledge, the money doesn't reach who is in most need of it. The number of decentralized organizations working in the Amazon makes it harder for financial institutions to decide which will truly use the resource for protection. Moreover, applying traditional market tools to evaluate cooperatives capacity of repayment are still not enough as it should consider other factors such as their contribution to keep the forest standing. But the Amazon Green Credit Hub was proposed to solve this challenge and allow these cooperatives to access microcredit while there's risking financial institutions green investment. Next slide, please. The Amazon Green Credit Hub is a multi-stakeholder platform that will facilitate microcredit origination through our own certification methodology. As you can see on the left, the hub will connect existing and new credit lines with sustainable cooperatives in the Amazon, becoming a trusted standard for funders and banks to find the most vulnerable yet meaningful beneficiaries. Kirsi, if you can click, I think we are with the previous version of the presentation. Thank you. We will partner with local organizations, our green agents are already established in the Amazon that work directly with our target cooperatives, leveraging their capacity of raising funds. These agents will help us to certify the cooperatives based on their potential to avoid emissions, generate carbon credits, and other social co benefits. The methodology will also take into consideration credit repayment risk, but suggesting a tailored pay as you produce the strategy, align it with gender and social context, needs, and seasonality impact on each cooperative. As you can see on the right, we also established standardized KPIs to measure socioeconomic and climate impact with the participation of a local focus group. Finally, we also provide technical assistance to promote the creation of new cooperatives to scale their hubs reach. Next slide, please. Increasing the economic return of regenerative production and nature-based products makes the forest standing more valuable than destroyed. Additionally, Helping these cooperatives access the market, we will unlock more funds to, for them to invest in new technologies, expand or aggregate more value to their products and services, and consequently, improve sustainable livelihoods while preserving the forest. Moving this group from passive grant support to financial market inclusion empowers these cooperatives to decide their investment strategy based on their real needs and scalability opportunities. This will also give them more autonomy and ownership of the project. Finally, the hub supports resilience development by promoting cooperativism and strengthening smallholders relationship with the local community and the environment. But the, the hub also aims to deliver a just and inclusive climate action, including gender and social particularities on our bottom up solution. Next slide, please. So we structure our pilot implementation in three stages. In our local engagement, we will create a gender balanced multi-level board with community leaders uh, green agents and financial institutions representatives. The board will develop a working plan with direct engagement from supply and demand stakeholders and establish the first focus group with pilot cooperatives. In the second stage, we'll focus on the methodology development with the selection of the primary funder to support the hub. 
and developed a sustainable tax certification through a digital platform to connect cooperatives with funders. Finally, we will focus on microcredit origination set to find the first round of beneficiaries in partnership with green agents and facilitating an One opening minute round remaining. of investment for certified cooperatives. The fees paid by financial institutions to access our certified cooperatives met will fund the hub's operation. A performance fee for successful projects invested through a platform will also ensure that our expansion plans go through. The choosing cooperatives will receive our service free of cost and also expect to remunerate green agents based on the quality of the information they will provide to us. With the TA, we aim to help more communities to develop social capital and establish new cooperatives. Our method can be replicated in other regions of Brazil where economic pressure for environmental destruction is also a problem. We are the Amazon Green Credit Hub. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for that really comprehensive presentation of your policy proposal um, and apologies for the animations that were remaining in your slides there. Um, you handled it very well. Thank you. Um, no so over to our judging panel. Um, judges, do you have any questions for this team? Yes, we have a hand up from Mark. Hello there. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation. My question is the extent to which you've looked at other locations and drawn on those for inspiration. So have you seen uh, something similar to what you have been proposing um, working in a different location, which I think would be a really good demonstration of feasibility? Hi, Mark. Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think that one of the examples we try to do interviews with local people, not only from the Amazon forest, but also we, one of our advisors, which was Sierra Zone, is an expert in Bangladesh. And she helped us to make a reference for the connections of the bottom up approach. So we haven't found one organization that makes this integration. And we believe this is the innovation side of our proposition. You have many other organizations already acting on the ground in the Amazon forest, including offering um, funding for these cooperatives. But one of the challenges we identify we, when speaking with this uh, in our research is either the ticket was too high, so really micro um, cooperatives could not access the funding that even um, localized organizations offer to them. Um, and the second one is you have a lack of standardization, which will help financial institutions to understand whether they can invest or not. So I think that the innovation that we, we try to create our own is exactly this connection organization that will make this uh, methodology standardized across the players we already have in the area. Um, but we, we didn't look for exactly, we didn't find exactly one similar institution that is making this connection as we are proposing at the moment. Super, thanks very much. Great, thank you both. Um, the second live question, uh, we have a hand up from our judge, Sergei. So over to you with your question. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. Just wanted to ask probably basic question, uh, which I um, probably missed. Uh, uh, first, I mean, what type of uh, loans, uh, right, you are considering here? So. Uh, for harvesting or uh, SME or, I mean, can you give a bit more details? And second question, uh, I understand you're going to solve some organizational issue or, and uh, the size of the loan is uh, high, you mentioned, but what are kind of key barriers now for the current uh, you know, borrowers which you're going to solve through the platform? Thank you. Perfect, Sergey. Um Hard questions, which is uh, good for us so we can explain. The first point is we don't, we want to facilitate microcredit origination, but we won't be responsible for um, lowering the money directly. We discussed it with financial institutions in Brazil already, and one of the good examples is Santander, which is a big bank, and they already have the prosperity fund. So um, it's dedicated for microcredit focus on these type of cooperatives. The problem is literally matching them. And that's where we want to guarantee that the instruments that they already have established from financial institutions reach the, those that are in most need. So um, you can have in this perspective of the methodology is whatever instrument the financial institutions is already offering to this type of cooperatives, this it's open. We've just certified that they are good enough based on not only on the repayment strategy, 
but also the climate impact that data cooperatives will, will offer um, inside the Amazon forest, but then scaling to all the areas of Brazil that is not focused when we think in scalability, you could replicate this methodology saying, okay, what is the local context and how I can adapt the methodology for institutions that are not focused on the Amazon, but it's focused on the Cerrado or the Atlantic um, forest as well. So we can have this adaptation and that's why we decided rather than getting the money from the financial institutions, um, just making the connection with them, which simplify and makes us more um, viable in our perspective. The second point is the barriers. I think that the barriers for at the moment for the cooperatives is because they are too small and considering the geographic region we are attacking, um, you have lack of documentation you have um, bank access, it's a complicated um, item for them. So we were discussing in our research and many um, cooperatives would depend on a bank boat. So they only have access to the bank twice a week, for example, when that boat is um, um, navigating through their region. So our idea is how can we start with that people that is already, um, let's say pre-approved for banking in the near area of uh, big cities, and with the performance fee that we suggested for our scalability, we start to grow our investment to make banking access, for example, uh, being possible in remote areas that is not attended yet. And we can use internet technology, we can use um, fintechs to help us, whether you don't need a physical area to access bank, but you can use your smartphone. So this is a, one of the examples of barriers that we method and we establish our proposition based on, on how we can overcome this, this challenge currently in the Amazon forest. Great, thank you. Great, thank you so much to our team, our two judges and also to Team Accessible Finance Brazil. Um, do remember attendees that you can continue to ask questions. Team members are ready and waiting to answer them in the chat box. Um, so thank you for that presentation again. Thank you very much, Kirsty, and all the judges. Fantastic. Um, we will now move on to our second team who will be presenting under the COP goal collaboration. The team is Sunrise and has three members, all from Nigeria. It's a mixed team comprised of Chevening and CSC alumni. Our presenter will be Ire Olua Adegoka and answering questions in the chat box will be Yatunde Fadii. So over to you, Sunrise. Okay, welcome everyone to this presentation. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, before we go into the depth of this presentation, I would just like to give some context around the Nigerian energy situation. So between 2016 to 2021, the Nigerian government has introduced at least five innovative policies relating to climate change and uh, energy access targeted at rural population. But our evaluation of these policies uh, looking at several key assessment metrics like affordability, adaptation, distribution, and stakeholder participation, we realize that there is actually that these policies do not necessarily tackle the challenges that are facing poor and vulnerable population. And it also lacks sufficient operational inclusiveness to help Nigerians achieve its NDC goals. Next slide, please. A review of some of these uh, challenges are. Uh, helped us to identify some of the key challenges that is currently affecting the development of the Nigerian rural electrification process. Is still, we still see the increasing use of fossil energy for sources, which is affecting the rural landscape. We also see that the current mini grid programs is actually very unaffordable and thereby marginalizes vulnerable and unsafe population, even within existing sites of, of, of where mini grid, of mini grid leading to a high rate of zero users. Uh, we also see that there is also a lack of diversification resulting in low adaptation of adoption of other technologies as these projects and programs are currently dominated by solar energy, which means that uh, other technologies like wind, hydro are currently being neglected. Uh, we also see some of the challenges uh, that uh, the consumers are currently just beneficiaries and they are not being put as the center of these innovations and this policy. Uh, we also see that the administration of these policies is actually much more centralized and is much more adopted towards the top to bottom approach. 
And because of these challenges, we still face serious challenges in financial inclusion as these customers lack the financial access to modern energy services. And lastly, we also identify that some of the solutions being preferred are you know, reflecting on solar technologies that are scalable and due to adequate uh, monitoring and evaluation process, they are currently contributing to electronic waste in our communities. Next slide, please. So our solution is based on identifying some deliverables that we believe are feasible and practical and achievable between now and 2023. We see the importance of developing about a thousand community developed projects in collaboration with the community owners uh, and leading to a diversified energy mix focused on 50% on solar, hydro 20%, wind 20%, and about 10% of, of, uh, on, on, on other energy sources. We also hope that uh, with our projects, we can be able to achieve a 35% you know, reduction in Nigeria's electricity sector emission which currently sits at about uh, 60%. That is, the electricity sector currently contributes about 60% of total emissions. Uh, we also see the importance to, for planting of about 5,000 trees of local importance based on the assumption that one tree will be planted for every two kilowatts of power plant constructed. This will help in offsetting carbon and deforestation impact. We also see the utilization of existing social protection fund through the, through the creation of a electricity subsidy for the proper communities in this existing site. Currently, uh, in a good number or a significant number of states in Nigeria, uh, the, poor, uh, the identified poor members uh, receive a 5,000 Naira uh, subsidies for their livelihood and other activities. We hope to just take a fraction of this, just 10%, and channel that to electricity subsidies, which we believe will impact the efficiency of social protection programs, which based on current report One has an implementation rate of about, of about zero to 1% of our own. Next slide, please. So we believe that this impact of this to our project will help to reduce uh, the reliance of climate sensitive resources through impacting these various sectors as a can see on your screen. Next slide, please. So part of the process of our implementation of the, our policy is we believe that our policy will include a consultative process, diversification of and localization of energy resources, leveraging of social protection scheme, a decentralized coordination and a multi-stakeholder model whereby the poor and vulnerable are recognized as key actors in their own development. And we also see the need of the introduction of the credit to credit analysis so that each developer is limiting their environmental hazard and this can be effectively tracked. In summary, we believe that our solution, our proposal will really help, you know, to ensure that energy access is really all inclusive and offers sufficient social protection to the poor and vulnerable. And it allows our communities to actually play an important role in defining their own future. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to our team Sunrise presenting there under the COP goal for collaboration. Um, fantastic information in that proposal. Um, do we have any questions from our judges for team Sunrise? Ah, Haseeb, you have your hand up. You can take the first question. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, proposition. I was just wondering, uh, in, in many of our countries, it is quite challenging to have a policy approved. Since the Nigerian government has approved so many policies over the last five years or so, why do you think that this new approach, coordinated approach, should be appreciated by them? Because they haven't thought of that coordinated um, engagement, arrangement. What would be the selling point to your government? Thank you. Thank you. So I think what our approach did, which we are carefully examined, is that we look at the existing policies and we identify the gaps that exist in these existing policies. Our goal is still to leverage the existing infrastructures, even existing process and programs that the government has currently designed. Regarding, for example, if I bring about the point of solar energy, the government still has a plan to actually diversify its energy mix, but the problem is that right now that is still very, it's still very at the very early stage of planning and early stage of design. 
So we, if, we, if I bring the concept of the social protection program, at the moment, the government is currently introducing a means of digitalization, leveraging uh, uh, what's named banking technologies to actually ensure that you know, issues of corruption are being addressed. All we are proposing in that scheme is that instead of giving this cash to this, cons this particular population, why not make this a direct subsidy that is paid directly to the developer of the mini grid site where these projects are being developed? At the moment, organization, NGUs, energy access organizations currently work with the government to develop some of these policies. So it's just about changing some of the mindset and just realigning some of the processes that the government has in place. And with the, with the, with the use of you know, influencers and even our own personal participation, in this sector, we believe that we'll be able to achieve uh, some of these targets. And if you go to tree planting, there are a number of private and, 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 and public organizations that are involved in tree planting. And even our government departments are currently involved in this process. So there are not necessarily new things that, you know, it will require a long time to get the, the government or the particular agency by in to really implement. It's just introducing that, uh, into the current process, uh, which we believe is, is much, is very feasible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another really in-depth response to a question from a judge. Um, the second question from our panel is going to Joanna Poon. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, it's very interesting. Um, I got a question is asked, um, one of the proposed solution uh, mentioned is the multi-stakeholders uh, approach. We, uh, so I, I would like to ask for your insight of how would you, um, what's your suggestion for different countries to collaborate and contribute to, to this multi-stakeholders approach? Okay, so I think that the Nigerian government is actually involved in several uh, multi-countries or multilateral development-based projects and programs. So I think that with this proposal, we believe that, you know, they, for example, the UK government is a very strong active partner with the Nigerian government. And we believe that these proposals can be implemented leveraging these development partners. In fact, it's just that it wasn't presented in our slide, but we've actually identified some key development partners to execute this project who are leading in this space. For example, AFDB, the Germany's GIZ, the UK government and even Power Africa. These are all notable leading organizations that actually have been involved in the current design of the rural electrification project, which we believe that uh, uh, it's actually much more open and more inclusive. At the moment, we actually, the current uh, rural electrification programs has you know, international developers, you which are benefiting from the government subsidy to build solar mini grid in Nigeria. And all of these are being announced through the collaboration with World Bank, the different uh, national institutions. So we believe that leveraging that existing framework, you know, other countries can participate and leveraging the current multilateral partnership and agreement that are in place, we believe that they can also tie into some of these uh, solution we have proposed. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much uh, to Team Sunrise for your presentation and those responses to the questions. Um, there are a few more in the chat box, so um, you will be responding to those quite soon. And just to remind attendees, if you do have questions, please pop them into the chat box and team members are ready to answer them. We're halfway through our team presentations now. Um, so I'm going to introduce our third team. Uh, our third team is called Mountain Mates, and they'll be presenting under the adaptation goal. The team has four members representing all three scholarship programs. That's Chevening, CSC and Marshall. Team members are from the USA, India, South Africa and Pakistan. Our presenter will be Subalele Ngomane and answering questions in the chat box will be Gitanjali Singh. So over to you, Mountain Mates. Thank you, Kirsty. I'm Sibulele and pleased to present the Mountain Mates policy. Next slide, please. Our policy focuses on the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. This is a transnational boundary covering eight countries and over 200 million people. It is a fragile ecosystem and most vulnerable to climate change. For example, there is rapid population growth, high poverty incidence, and a growing food insecurity. Given that the majority of the population are engaged in agriculture, extreme weather patterns triggered by climate change 
will severely threaten the lives and the livelihoods of the people of the HKH. Therefore, it is essential to strengthen agricultural practices in this region. Next slide. Our solution to this problem is to introduce indigenous crops and livestock species back into the region. These crops were historically bred to withstand harsh weather conditions, but were neglected due to lack of market advocacy. Nonetheless, we found with the correct policy, NUS can build agricultural adaptation whilst providing excellent nutrition and co commercial opportunities for locals. For example, the horse gram legume, which is native to the Indian Himalayas, is drought tolerant and has more protein and carbohydrate content than currently cultivated cash crops. As a result, our policy has three pillars. The financial programs is the first pillar will ensure farmers can transition successfully and risk fee into NUS farming. For example, the purchase support program provides farmers with a climate resilient infrastructure, such as off season cultivation tunnels, irrigation pumps and solar dryers. In the second pillar, we will provide farmers with the opportunity to improve their knowledge of NUS farming whilst being included in the process. The final pillar focuses on increasing the market value for NUS foods. As a first step, we will tag NUS foods with geographic indicators. GI tags are a WTO instrument which show the region and the characteristic of a particular food. When we did our research for this hackathon, we found Himalayan NUS foods are not GI tag, which limits their advocacy. Well, most Himalayan NUS foods, sorry. We will not only GI tag these foods, but also include climate resilience as a key characteristic. Once a food is GI tag and sold in the supermarkets, it will be stamped with a specific brand logo, which will encourage its consumption. We created a prototype of this logo, which you can see on the right. If I may mention our three policy pillars also mirror the three pillars of food security, which are accessibility, affordability, and absorption, which leads me to our impact. Next slide. Firstly, our policy will ensure sustained agriculture despite unpredictable weather conditions. Secondly, given the intersectionality for climate change and food security, our policy will have a triple bottom line impact for people, profits, and the planet. Farmers will have a stable and diversified income. Poverty and malnutrition will decline. The HK region will enjoy climate resilience and increased biodiversity. These results will also aid in meeting at least seven of the sustainable development goals. You can find those examples to the right. Finally, given the size of this region, our policy will also strengthen inter-regional cooperation, which ties very well with our policy implementation. Next slide. The implementation of our policy will take on an evidence-based, dynamic, and multi-stakeholder approach. In terms of accessibility, our working group will consist of several stakeholders, including those with extensive experience in the combination of the HKH region, agriculture, and climate change. These include ISIMOD and FAO. Regarding affordability, we, we anticipate project funding from inter international organizations with an existing presence in this region. Examples are Visa, the GIZ, and the UK government. We know, for example, that 7% of the UK's ODA to Pakistan already goes towards this region, as this is one of the priority areas for the UK government. Moreover, several banks in this region already have farming loans, which can be directly appropriated to this policy. It also has a commercial aspect that will be self-sustaining in the long run. Finally, we'll scale our policy with a six-phase implementation plan. Central to this is rolling out our policy pillars in a pilot country, then evaluating those results and changing the policy when necessary, then rolling it out to the remaining seven countries. This brings me to the end of our presentation. Next slide. I would also like to introduce our team members who work very hard on this presentation. We're a combination of agricultural specialists, climate change policy managers, and economists. We've created a policy that fosters adaptation in our region, but also feeds into the remaining COP26 goals, such as finance, collaboration, and mitigation. We have pitched a three pillar policy which will ensure food security through affordable, accessible, and scalable instruments for farmers and policymakers alike. We have argued that this policy will be self-sustaining in the long run, which will lead to benefits for people, profits, and the planet. I thank you for your attention and I can open the panel for questions. Thank you so much for that presentation. And of course, um, we must, of course, congratulate all of the members of each of the teams. You are seeing the presenters, um, but I assure you within our participant list today, we can see all members of those teams who have contributed to each of the proposals. Um, so absolutely, please do shout out to everybody that's taken part and is in your team. Um, so we have two hands up. 
from judges. Uh, Hasib, I believe your hand up was first, so we'll go to you for the first question. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, very interesting uh, proposition. I was just wondering, uh, uh, all is good, uh, you know, reintroducing the uh, underutilized species, both plants and animals, and uh, uh, focusing on three pillars. But the whole area is quite uh, politically quite diverse. Their relationship, uh, you know, they, they share so many things, uh, water ecosystems. But don't you think that it is a quite a big risk to propose these throughout the region? Have you seen during your research, have you seen some other areas where cooperation took place that actually inspired you to propose this kind of, uh, you know, in the Kush Himalaya, in the Kush region wide uh, uh, intervention? Thank you so much, Hasi, for your question. I would just like to clarify on the second part of your question. Do you mean inspiration from the HK region or from other regions? Uh, in, the, in this particular region, because it is so diverse, do you see any positive things that happened recently that inspired you to propose this? Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for your questions. I, we definitely agree with you that um, this is a very big area. And I think it's a very fair point to point out that with any policy, be it ours or any others that are proposing general political will is an essential um, barrier. I think though with our policy, our region makes it a very critical area. So we're reading earlier today that in about 80 years, at least 36% of the glaciers in this entire region will melt. This means that whether we like it or not, this will impact the region. And I mean, even if you look at statistics, even if we stick below the two degree rise in targets in this region, for the HKH region, the temperatures will still rise by above two degrees. And I think this is already a very good point for political actors in this region to be very concerned and to also have political will. I think in our, in our implementation uh, phase, I also mentioned that we'll include multi-stakeholder approach. So I think this is very important for any government and countries as well to have people there that are, have either provide checks and balances and also provide expertise. So we would choose a convening body that obviously um, has people from the HKH region, but also has people who are not um, politically um, bound to this region. However, our experts or have enough uh, project funding to really push um, for this policy to go through. To answer your second question, yes, I think, um, so yes, we haven't seen in the HKH region where the NUS foods are being implemented, but it definitely is already within the climate change landscape, a unified um, region where policymakers and international donors are already focusing on. Um, I think you're very correct in saying that biodiversity, such as um, the different plant and ecosystems are being um, already implemented and being focused on. And I think this is why our policy is also very in innovative because we are also looking at the people. We went, um, we, the first thing we decided when we were working on our policy is the region. And we decided that we want to focus on this region because it's very critical, but we noticed that a lot of these policies don't directly look at the impact that it has on people. So our policy really focuses, as mentioned, on the lives of the people because they eat the agriculture that's produced, but also most of them are farmers. So then it also creates um, opportunities for um, commerce and also reduces poverty for them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another really comprehensive response to judges' questions there. Um, your second question is gonna come from uh, Dr. Tebeth. Hello there. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. That was really super. Um, I guess my, my question relates to the uh, the often perceived benefits that I guess more commercial crops bring in terms of cash returns and how that tends to be played off against um, the sorts of crops that you're talking about, which are potentially more robust in terms of how they can cope with extreme climates, for instance but often offer lower cash returns. So if you agree with that prognosis, then how would you, um, I guess, convince growers that um, these are the, the crops for them, that these are the crops that they need to choose? 
or equally how would you convince them that actually these particular crops can give greater returns maybe over a slightly longer time frame than perhaps one growing season? Thank you so much um, for a very um, interesting question. I think, um, firstly, maybe something we should have mentioned in our presentation is that we're not um, fostering a complete substitution. So there will still be some um, staple crops farming. What we are fostering is more the diversification of the crops. Um, if you look into the agriculture of cash crops, such as potatoes and rice, they were genetically bred to, to be produced in ideal weather conditions. As also mentioned then in our presentation, this won't be the case, unfortunately, for the HKH region. Thus, we definitely need um, crops that can also be planted in unseasonable weather or harsh conditions or unpredictable conditions. So then when you have the combination of um, cash crops and also um, our NUS crops, this will create a very diverse and also stable um, access to agriculture. In terms of pitching this, I think um, the first and most important thing is to realize that already the people um, in the HKH region are facing food insecurity. So um, some of the statistics are that 30% of the people have food insecurity and 50% already have malnutrition. And I think in terms of convincing local farmers why this is important is really educating them on the importance of these um, crops in terms of nutritional value and also um, the commercial aspects. In our second pillar, we talked about um, experts training, first of all, on how to use the, the, the machinery. We also talked, um, showed that it will be a peer-to-peer -peer learning um, opportunity. So this is a place where stakeholders can come together and really discuss some of the challenges and where they can learn from each other how to improve. In terms of the commercial aspect, in the first pillar, we have um, a price matching uh, strategy. This means that the governments and private sector actors will set a minimum price that will, where they will purchase any remaining um, harvest of NUS. Um, I think, we, and it's also very valid in terms of the, the, the market penetration. Um, and I think that's why we covered um, this in the third pillar that we'll have a brand logo, so to say, of these crops, which will inspire consumers. And I mean, if we're looking not only from the HK region, but the, the plains, also the international world, there's a current rise in the, in the need and the desire for superfoods. And if you consider some of these foods, such as the zuki beans, the horse grain beguns, and also amrita, these are considered globally as superfoods. So not only will they be tapping into their own local and national markets, they also have the chance to tap into international markets. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good response. Thank you so much um, to our team Mountain Mates uh, for your presentation and then again um, for your responses there to questions from judges. We are now at our final team. Uh, so our final team today is IMAGED, which stands for Incentives for Mitigating Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Emissions with Data. They will be presenting under the mitigation COP26 goal. And they're a team of two Marshall Scholars, both from the USA. Our presenter will be Anjali Tripathi and answering questions in the chat box will be Yun William Yu. So over to you team. I'm delighted today to share you with you a technological solution from the air and space to tackle one of the most challenging uh, greenhouse gas emission sources, and that is agricultural methane. Next slide, please. So methane is the second most abundant greenhouse gas, and it's very powerful. It's 85 times the warming potential of carbon dioxide. As you can see in the image on the right, agriculture accounts for um, over half, roughly half of um, total anthropogenic methane emissions. And within that, livestock um, production is a major source of methane emissions. In the US where our team originates, animal production is largely concentrated in industrial production lots known as concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs, and these tend to be methane super emitters. And so if you want to get a handle on methane mitigation, you really have to tackle this huge source of emissions. But it's been really difficult to do that in large part because the data for where the emissions are coming from, especially for individual farms, has not been available. And moreover, there just haven't been the incentives to reduce emissions in agriculture the same 
same way there have been for oil and gas, where a leak in methane pipelines um, is something that'll cost you profit. So next slide, please. So what we're proposing is a three-tiered approach, like the other teams today, all in threes, um, where the first step is to make the data of these emissions available. And this is very timely because both now and in the coming years, there are a suite of satellites coming online focused on the problem of methane down to point source individual farm scale. And so when that's available for use by policymakers and others, that can be the basis for further steps uh, to really tackle the problem of agricultural methane from super emitters. So level two is going to make use of this data and offer an opt-in certification standard for low methane emissions for producers. So responsible producers have an incentive to showcase their good work and it gives consumers an opportunity to vote with their feet. Um, and participate in supporting this goal. Once you've built up this consensus, which is very important for uh, really a convening power, um, then you can transition to level three, which is to have an all of government um, and all of society approach to agricultural subsidies that are based on this emissions data. Next slide, please. And so NASA has actually done a pilot project with the state of California. And what they found is that 10% of methane super emitters across the state from oil and gas agriculture and waste management um, are responsible for 60% of emissions. So we've done the math for our team. And if you actually calculate um, the US and EU's agricultural livestock methane emissions and what could be reduced with our proposal, the impact is about 5% of total methane emissions. So that's one sixth of the global methane pledge made by the US, Europe, and about a dozen other signatories to reduce methane emissions by 2030, um, by 30%. And this would contribute um, 0.2 degrees C reduction by 2050. So this is a remarkably powerful approach for mitigation and it's already been proven in the state of California. So we're glad that this policy proposal empowers both producers and consumers to get involved in low methane emissions um, and to really champion this idea. But we're also really proud to contribute to helping vulnerable communities because this will help reduce emissions that cause respiratory and cardiovascular problems um, and agricultural farm labor who's often overlooked in some of these policy proposals. But you know, at the foundation of all of this is making the data available to policymakers, academics and others so that you can manage what has otherwise been invisible. Next slide, please. And so what we would like to do is based off of the NASA California methane survey, where here's a figure showing you all of the sites that they surveyed in California. And that box actually shows you a dairy farm where the blue is the methane leak. Um, we wanna actually use this data for our first step, which is to do a report projecting out the economic impacts and prototyping our proposal. Um, once we do this with the existing data set, we actually plan, and we've already started on this report, I should say. Our plan is to actually socialize this with trade and industry groups to get their interest in building a low methane certification alliance. Because once we've got their buy-in and interest, it's much more feasible to transition elsewhere. And so then we can share this with governments and others. Um, so we hope that using this data infrastructure from these satellites that are coming on board, we can drive an ambitious but feasible um, mitigation goal. So with that, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks to my teammate, William, who has been amazing. Thank you so much for that presentation and some really interesting ideas again there. And again, the power of three. Uh, as you've mentioned from the other policy proposals that we've seen today. Um, I'm just checking, we do have a hand up from one of our judges. Uh, so the first question will come from Sergey. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. And I uh, would like to clarify, because this is a quite comprehensive, but very specific at the same time. What are the key uh, bottlenecks you see on the implementation, uh, it, whether it's related to uh technical issues i presume not because you have quite a lot of data or probably regulation issue of certificates or uh subsidies uh, you know you mentioned that you you would like to link it to the subsidies this will be another kind of area which may you know present uh, additional challenges uh, interesting to learn so thanks so much for your question, uh, Dr. Meslichenko. Um, of course, there are challenges at every stage. If I said there were no challenges, I would be lying. Um, I think the sort of the 
initial one that can be quite a barrier to all of this is the data availability. So those satellites that we mentioned, um, GHGSAT, MethaneSat, Carbon Mapper, um, they have different timelines and different regional focus and repeats. And so I think because the coverage is uneven, you know, you cannot just jump from level one to level three overnight. You actually really have to have that period where there are certain farmers who have that data available to them. Um, I want to, for a side, <laughs> for a moment, digress that oil and gas companies have banded together to actually have their own methane sensing because, again, the leaks are profit and there's so much regulation on that. So there the producers are actually incentivized to do their own monitoring. In agriculture, that doesn't yet exist, but you can imagine if you had this whole structure, you could imagine these, you know, especially in the U.S. where we are um, really industrialized producers may be incentivized to do that. But until that point, um, it's going to be more of a patchwork. And so I think it's something that that's going to be a big bottleneck in terms of you cannot have this rolled out everywhere. It's going to be based on the data availability. I'm happy to speak to other challenges too, if you like, but in the interest of time, I'll pause there. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm just seeing if there are any more hands up from our judges, but I know that questions are still going into the chat box. Um, no, it looks like it's just the one question for you, but again, many are going into the chat box right now. Um, so thank you so much for your presentation as well. Okay, thank you. So we have now heard from each of our four finalist teams. So congratulations and thanks to each team on their presentation and also your responses to judges, questions and attendees. I can see some of them are in multiple parts. Um, so uh, keep going with looking through that chat box and getting back to um, judges and attendees with their queries. Our judges will now move to a separate meeting where they will discuss the policy proposals presented and identify an overall um, an overall apology um, where they'll identify an overall winning team. Um, whilst they are in that separate room, uh, sort of discussing all of those policies and the presentations that they've seen. Um, we're really pleased to be joined by members of the Achievening Sustainability Network. Its purpose is to gather alumni involved in or interested in all aspects of sustainability, from sustainable development to finance, impact measurement and questions around the current global climate challenges. It's a forum for exchanging knowledge, best practice and ideas. And the network organises regular events, often including a speaker and or an impactful video as a topic of discussion. Today's speakers from the CSN are Olga Diachenko, co-founder of the Achieving Sustainability Network, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the network's history, and Krishnan Insan, a new member who will speak a little about the future plans for the CSN as well. So welcome to you both and thank you for joining today. Um, I will let you tell us more about the network. Hi everyone. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for inviting and we are always happy to tell people more about Chewing Sustainability Network. May I just share these slides if possible? Or maybe it is not possible. Okay, so as, as it was just mentioned, uh, the Tuning Sustainability Network was uh, founded in 2020, and actually even in 2019. And the goal of Tuning Sustainability Network was to govern people uh, with, different with the decryption background, but all related to uh, sustainable Wait. development. So over this time, we yes. actually uh, grew the community of uh, uh, 600 members. Yes. And, uh, hello, someone is talking with me. Yeah, okay, should be fine. Yeah, so we've grown the community of 600 members. And as, as it just was mentioned, we run the monthly talks uh, related to different subjects. For example, we uh, often speak about sustainable finance and some of our members share 
uh, the best practices of the sustainability governance in their countries. Also, we discuss uh, climate change and the such issues as uh, uh, deforestation or, for example, the lack of resources and water resources and other resources. So the discussions are normally uh, normally take uh, for about an hour or two and uh, we run them every month or a couple of months. Apart from that, we sometimes do film screening uh, to and then discuss films about all those documentaries about sustainability, and then we discuss them. So apart from that, we have the um, uh, live WhatsApp chat where everyone can share the uh, latest sustainability news and the um, uh, ideas and post some job advertisement uh, in Europe or in the UK or everywhere in the world. So we are, you are very welcome to join our network and just to share your ideas. We actually were planning to run some uh, uh, talks about uh, sustainable entrepreneurs and uh, maybe you guys can become one of the you your teams or uh, one of the team can become a speaker and talk about uh, sustainability projects in your countries and sustainable sustainable entrepreneurs. So I will just now introduce Krishan, who just joined our team of executive members. Krishan. Uh, thank you, Olga. And uh, thank you, Kristi, uh, for a very kind introduction of CSN. And uh, I uh, wish all the best to all the participants of the hackathon. And yes, uh, I think this is uh, our first time that CSN has been speaking to all the scholars uh, sponsored by FCDO, uh, including Chevening, Commonwealth, and Marshall. And this is a perfect platform. Uh, in fact, uh, Christy has mentioned in his uh, in her introductory uh, lecture that uh, this is a, this is an event which uh, promotes uh, global cooperation and networking. And uh, I, I cannot think of a better better platform to network among all kind of scholars and uh, bring bringing uh, synergy among all the scholars. So yes, uh, Olga has mentioned that how we operate. And uh, let me tell you about future plans. Uh, so first uh, first of all, I would like to tell uh, that uh, uh, to. Commonwealth as well as Marshall Scholars, we will be very happy that if you are interested to take any such initiative uh, within your alma mater and uh, want to start a sustainability network uh, within Commonwealth Scholars or within Marshall, uh, Marshall Scholars. And uh, Chevening uh, Sustainability Network will be very happy to handhold and uh, uh, discuss that how we started and uh, how we start pl started planning events, how did it go. At the same time, uh, Olga has mentioned that uh, we will see that what kind of synergy we can bring uh, either by inviting uh, cross fellowship, cross scholarship uh, al alumni for the programs depending on their specialism, depending on their expertise, expertise and where they are working. Uh, as far as future plans of CSN are concerned, I'm delighted to tell that we have lot many events planned up um, uh, coming in the uh, next few months. Uh, for last uh, almost five to six months, we have been focusing events in and around uh, on the theme of COP26, which uh, has been a very focused area for us uh, during 2021. And uh, in, in the coming months, we have lined up a uh, speaker lined up from uh, central banks. We have people from, fi uh, from financial market regulators because we know that climate and sustainability and the financial sector has a uh, very important role to play. Pension funds are very important to that. We are uh, having speakers on board uh, who are working with pension funds to speak on uh, CSN network. Um, we have professionals uh, who are working on ground ground level. We have people, even uh, uh, we have uh, Commonwealth and uh, we have Chevening scholars who are responsible for net zero in their respective organization. Particularly, I'm talking about multinational banks and retail industry. They are going to share their experience that how they are uh, planning to, uh, uh, you know, implement net zero within their organization at global level. So uh, the, these are the diverse area which we are bringing into uh, very recently. Uh, we have conducted events where we have invited speakers from 
uh, European Bank. We have uh, invited the speakers who has who has uh, launched Green Bonds. Uh, all all the evening alumni uh, I'm talking about. So yes, uh, as far as bringing uh, synergy between uh, all the all three scholarships, we are happy to collaborate. Uh, feel free to reach out to either of the executive committee member of CSN. Um, Olga will share the uh, coordinates of social media coordinates uh, and email ID. You can reach out to us, uh, reach out to us on the email ID. And if uh, common uh, somebody is interested to take a lead to set up uh, sustainability network, uh, they are free to reach to Olga or to me through LinkedIn or um, whatever way you feel suitable to. At the same time, we uh, we are happy to have. Uh, some events uh, in collaboration with uh, all three scholarships where we can bring uh, pe uh, people of uh, wide experience and exposure on the same platform and uh, how we can uh, you know uh, make impact and the uh, which which can be reflected that how fcdo is contributing um, to achieve net zero and bringing the sustainable uh, development in 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 the ground on the ground uh, with this, uh, I'm happy if anybody has any question regarding CSN, I'm happy to answer that. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Olga and Krishan, for your introduction to the Chevening Sustainability Network. It sounds like a really fantastic network to bring together um, lots of different Chevening alumni from various different subject areas um, and kind of professional networks as well. And thank you also um, for kind of encouraging uh, members of uh, Marshall and Commonwealth alumni groups to also get involved and think about creating their own sustainability network. I think there's a lot of ideas there and a lot of food for thought. So thank you so much. Um, to our attendees, you will see um, that they have both dropped in the information for you to get involved in these groups. Um, so please do uh, kind of read that. And also, um, you know, take the opportunity now to drop any questions that you have into the chat box as well. Um, they will be here until the end of the presentation. Um, so you have time to have a look um, and think of your questions. We're going to move on um, now. And we're just going to, whilst our judges are still kind of continuing to deliberate, um, this is a video that um, the Chevening Sustainability Network actually recommended to us. Um, and we just want to take this time to give our attendees uh, the opportunity to reflect on COP26, climate change, and the goals our teams have been discussing and the ideas that they've been discussing as well. The climate crisis affects every person, every country and every region, as you know, and as you'll have seen today in the various different challenges that teams have been looking at. Big ideas from the best minds are needed to help tackle this crisis. We'd like to share with attendees a short video titled How to Save the Planet. Um, in the video, Sir David Attenborough explains how humans can take charge of our future and save our planet. Um, you'll see on the screen there a, a link to a short clip which is from a Netflix original documentary series and groundbreaking collaboration between the WWF Netflix and Silverback films titled Our Planet. Um, the, the original documentary series showcases the world's natural wonders, iconic species and wildlife spectacles that still remain. And again, really reinforces why we're talking about climate change, why we're talking about climate action and why we need to act now to protect our planet. Um, the video will last approximately eight and a half minutes. And we want to just give this opportunity um, for attendees to copy the link either from the screen and I will drop it into the chat box and watch this um, on your own device. Um, this will hopefully ensure the best connection and viewing for everybody in attendance. Um, you don't need to leave the event, um, but please ensure that your microphones remain muted whilst you're watching the video. Um, you'll see from the time there on the screen that we are running a little bit uh, over, but we still have time. Um, and I'm sure everyone will want to come back to find out who our winning team is and the sort of comments from judges. So we will resume this event um, at, let me work out the time, 18 minutes past four. Um, and that's when our judges will come back to do the roundup. Um, tell us who the winning overall hackathon team is, um, and we'll close off the event at that point. Um, 
and I will call back. So if you keep this event running whilst you're watching the video, you will hear me start talking again um, when it's time to come back into the room. So let me just copy that link for you all. And please do take the time to watch that video and introduction from Sir David Attenborough. All right, uh, welcome back to our attendees. I hope that that um, has given you enough time to watch the video that we shared in the link. Um, if you haven't had a chance to do it, um, then please do save the link that's in the chat box. Um, and I would encourage you to sort of have a look at sort of further related um, information that's being shared during COP26. Um, and in particular, have a look at the website um, around the various different discussions and events and activities that are going to be taking place um, from the 31st of October until the 12th of um, November. So our judges should now have completed um, their discussions and they looks like they are now rejoining us. Um, to announce the winning team. Um, it's a very exciting point for us and for all of our teams. And I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you to our teams for all of the work that has gone into the presentations that we've seen today. Um, and also to take the opportunity to again thank our judges and advisors who have supported teams um, over the last few weeks as well. Just before I ask one of the judges to um, announce the uh, winning team, I just want to go through and just remind everybody of the presentations that we have seen today. So under the COP26 goal finance, we saw Team Accessible Finance Brazil with the policy of the Amazon Green Credit Hub. For collaboration, we saw Team Sunrise with the policy National Plan on People-Centred Clean Electricity Transitions Policy 2021. For adaptation, we heard from Mountain Mates with the policy Reintroducing Neglected and Underutilised Species in the Hindu Kush Himalayas for Climate Resilience. And the final team that presented today under the mitigation goal was IMAGED, which stands for Incentives for Mitigating Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Emissions with Data, with the policy Incentives for Mitigating Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Emissions with Data. Um, I will now hand over to one of our judges to announce the overall winning hackathon team today. Okay, shall I shall I announce the winning team? We didn't actually discuss this in our um, in our <laughs> we didn't discuss this in our breakout, so uh, we haven't prepped. Um, but I am very pleased to announce that the winning team in the hackathon will be Mountain Mates. Um, so well done, Mountain Mates! If you a clap, excellent work. Um, and I just. Uh, before I hand back to uh, Kirsty, I assume it will be. I, I want to say to all of the all of the four finalists that it was a it was a super close decision. So we really uh, we really struggled to pick a winner, and I, I really hope that that doesn't um, that doesn't bring hollow. I think all of the presentations were really really excellent presentations, and you've clearly put a huge amount of um, a huge amount of work. Um, into your preparation and your presentation. So uh, very well done to all of the teams. Um, and I guess we just felt in terms of mountain mates that they just had a slight edge in terms of thinking through the whole process from the, be from the beginning all the way through to the kind of the commercialization um, right through to the end of the process. So uh, very, very well done to you all. Thanks very much. Well, thank you um, so much for announcing um, our winner team. Apologies to put you on the spot there. Um, congratulations to Team Mountain Mates. Um, I wonder if anybody from the team would just like to say a few words um, about either their policy or their experience of the hackathon as well. Hi, um, thank you so much, uh, judges. It was really exciting news. 
Um, I think my teammates are there. I think I've spoke <laughs> a lot today. I don't know if anyone else in our team wants to give a vote of thanks. Um, maybe Daphne or Hamza are there. All right, okay, maybe not. So yeah, first of all, thank you so much for these wonderful news. Um, we worked really hard on the policy and we'd also like to thank the participants today. I think all of your policy ideas were very excellent and inspiring. And we hope that you can actually um, follow through with them on your individual channels. I think when we saw the presentation for the Shivning Sustainability Network, I think this will be a great way to actually build synergies. Um, for me, one of my main experiences um, in this competition was really working with a global team. Um, we're sitting in different countries and I think it really fosters our scholarship cohort to build networks across borders. Also, thank you so much to the judges. We're very um, excited by, by your profiles and we really thank you for the difficult um, questions that helped us in the first round and also now to really think through our policy as we keep um, improving it. And uh, last but not least, I would like to thank um, the HMG scholarships team. This was a very, very exciting competition. We thank you so much um, for organizing it for us. We did our hackathon in a 24 hour space. I can't even imagine how much time before the hackathon started, during and now after um, and the effort that you're putting into this. So we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Team Mountain Mates, and also to all of our teams today. We appreciate that the hackathon 24 hours to look at a climate related issue and come up with a policy is no easy feat. And that's something that our judges at every panel have said they've been really impressed with how in just 24 hours you have been able to break down some of these huge challenges and think of flexible and implementable ideas and policies. And that is a message to all of our teams today. Um, again, I just want to thank our judges. Um, and also our advisors for lending and volunteering their expertise and their knowledge. Um, you've been a real kind of just incredible force to have as part of the hackathon um, and also providing that support to teams as they've been developing their ideas as well. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank all of our guests and attendees today. Um, up until I think about 10 minutes ago, we were still getting questions to teams into the chat box. Um, so there's obviously a lot of thinking going on and a lot of ideas being created around some of the proposals that have been presented today, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and as we saw earlier, the Achieving Sustainability Network um, it provides an incredible opportunity, uh, similar to the hackathon, to bring together our scholarship alumni um, across all three programmes, Chevening, Commonwealth and Marshall, to really think about how we um, can face some of the global challenges um, and use our expertise together and collaboratively um, to come up with ideas and solutions. I'm going to now bring the hackathon um, final, grand final event to a close and with that the HMG Scholarships Alumni Climate Change Hackathon to a close as well. We really hope everyone has enjoyed being a part of this. It's been fantastic to see how teams have worked together um, and in particular, um, how new networks and uh, relationships have been formed through this opportunity. And we really do hope that they will be long lasting and will continue um, long after today's event um, has finished. As you know, um, we have been recording each of the presentation events. Um, these are currently uh, being edited and will soon be published on the scholarships YouTube channels. So there will be opportunities for you to go back and rewatch um, any of the events, as well as the shorter presentations that we've seen from each of the teams today. Um, so just to say again, thank you so much, everybody for taking part and for joining today. We hope that you have really enjoy this opportunity. And again, it's something that will be lasting um, and something to take away from COP26 this year. So thank you to everybody.